Hello. Today I'm speaking with Professor Orle Aschenfelter of Princeton University. Professor Aschenfelter is a longtime supporter of SERGI, and recently he was awarded an honorary doctorate degree from Charles University. One of your research interests is market for fine wine, and it looks like that you have a bit of an influence in the market. How do you get interested in wine? Uh, I actually was interested originally because uh, I, I learned about um, wine. I wanted to drink some, and uh, I was trying to find a way to, to learn enough so I could actually do a better job of buying wines for myself. And it, it became a, it's a, it's an important issue <coughs> for certain areas because um, the wines are kept for a long time, so you don't exactly know what they're going to be like when you finally drink them. Uh, the, the classic place for that is Bordeaux in France, those kind of wines. So I got interested in that and I started doing what I do in everything, which was quantitative work. <clears throat> and then it became a, it's kind of a life, took on a life of its own. In another extreme, you have also been a keen follower of McDonald's. Uh, it seems that you found more to McDonald's than good taste and uh, safety record. Can you tell us a little bit about your research on big macroeconomics? Well, the idea, that's the work I did with Stepan Ureta here at Surge GI. Um, the idea behind that work is just to try to measure the market wage rate for someone who does the exact same thing uh, in different countries and does the, has done the same thing over time. So the way you make a Big Mac is the same everywhere, and it's been the same throughout all the time that the, the restaurants have been in existence. So you have a standard, a standard job. Um, that you can compare over time and across countries. So the idea is to find a comparable wage rate. It's very difficult to find, to make a comparison between uh, uh, a country like uh, the wage rate in someone in South Africa, say, compared to the wage rate of someone in, in France, because they generally don't do the same things, probably don't have the same skills, but the workers in the McDonald's do. So it's a perfect way to compare them. I want to ask a question from a student's perspective. Your research works usually stand out because of their clever way of looking at data and uh, hypothesis testing. Is there an art of data collection and analysis? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, I describe what I do as uh, somewhat opportunistic, but I think that's also true for people that, that do economics without using data. Uh, in other words, I, I take advantage of situations uh, that I encounter and uh, try to use those to um, say something interesting about a more general question in economics. I, I've normally done empirical, I'm most interested in doing empirical things, um, but I, I think the, it, the, the strategy of uh, taking advantage of opportunities that just show up somehow is, uh, it, you can, that can be used by any economist. Um, that you can contrast that with uh, being an economist who uh, follows the literature. In other words, another way to do it is you read a paper and then you do something that's like that paper. Um, I don't usually do that. Usually what I do is uh, I try to do something that is, uh, it may have a connection to the literature, but usually it's uh, something different from what normally is being done. That's my own personal way of doing it from trade unions, dispute resolution, program evaluation, and natural experiments to the economics of wine. Uh, these scholarly contributions have made you one of the architects of modern labor economics. And it's hard to pick a highlight from this. Can you possibly do that? Well, I think the, the work I did on program evaluation has probably been the most influential. I mean, it, it, it created a sort of a revolution in the way that people do empirical economics. And it's spread, it was done, started in labor economics, but now it's done in lots of other areas. The same kind of ideas are being used in development economics, even, even industrial organization. Um, so it was a, it was a, it, it, it had a, the idea behind it was to try to actually measure the effect of an intervention. Uh, so it's a little bit like bringing the empirical methods of medicine or agriculture to other areas of economics. Um, and I think that has spread so much that you hear, I mean, you hear now the words natural experiment, uh, which is something we do uh, when we don't actually have the opportunity to randomize uh, and, and create real experiments. 
But you also now see quite a lot of, uh, of randomized trials, actual field experiments. Sometimes you can do field experiments using randomization. A lot of times you can't do that. So if you cannot do that, then you have to think of some other way to get some exogenous variability uh, using... Uh, um, that's why people call them natural experiments. I mean, the, there's many, many ways you can do that. For example, one, at one point I spent a lot of effort studying uh, the returns to schooling, payoff to schooling. And uh, uh, one concern there is natural ability, whether, whether maybe people who get more schooling have more natural ability. So we used a, a, a very odd natural experiment, which is uh, the production of, the, the, of twins. Mother Nature really made that experiment um, by, by occasionally uh, an egg splits. Uh, it's just an act that there's, there's no real understanding of why it happens. Um, and, uh, and then on the other hand, you need to have data on twins. It turns out there's a festival uh, in near outside of Cleveland, Ohio, it, that is called the, it's in a town called Twinsburg. And twins um, come there and celebrate their similarities as opposed to their differences. And uh, so we went there and interviewed people. Well, some other, other science, social scientists and, and, and medical people do that too. But that's an example. You can see that there that, that there's the natural experiment. There's the, you have to collect your own data, which would be easier if you didn't. Um, and then you have to figure out how you would get the data. So that's just an opportunistic thing. We, you, I happen to see about, I happen to learn about this festival on a television program of all things. And so then we did that. What do you consider your proudest moment? Well, it's difficult. The greatest honor probably for me uh, has been being selected as the president of the American Economic Association. That's pretty much the, the, the highest office to which uh, an economist would aspire. Um, the, 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 the upside is it's a great honor. The downside is it's a lot of work. <laughs> so it's not like the president of a company. You don't get paid. Uh, but that's, that's been a, an important moment. I would say, though, in gen more generally, um, I've had the most pleasure from students, from my students, uh, many of whom have been very, very successful. You've been involved with Sergei for over two decades. What was your impression when you first encountered Sergei? Uh, it was uh, really unique <coughs> in several dimensions. Um, uh, one was that it was um, free and open to um, former East Bloc, students from former East Bloc countries. Um, and it had an incredibly diverse, as it still does, student body coming from many, many different places. Um, the third thing was there was an entirely separate and uh, connected uh, English department. So that, uh, and related to that, was the fact that all the instruction was in English. Um, at that time, that was extremely unusual in Europe. In France, it was illegal to teach in English at that time. Um, now, uh, the Paris School of Economics that's all they teach in is English. So the, the Sergii program at that time was really uh, a uh, started something which others have adopted um, in many places. But the model basically is, uh, is in part inspired by the Sergii experience.